Hi, I'm Oliver and I'm presenting Amaro, a framework for combining genetic improvement with pattern mining. All of the source code is open source, available at amaro.dev. So, what is a pattern and why do we want to mine it? What you see here is an abstract syntax tree, the representation form that Amaro is using to optimize source code with genetic improvement. And if you have many of those abstract syntax trees, you can see repeating patterns forming, and that's exactly what you want to mine, patterns that frequently occur over multiple individuals in the GI population. And why do we want to do that? Well, software engineering, as we all know, is a pretty challenging task. It becomes even more challenging if you want to optimize for non-functional properties, such as runtime performance, memory performance, or if you want to optimize out a specific hardware. Just as an example, 75% of software maintenance is a perfective maintenance, meaning that they either improve the performance of something or fix bugs. And Overall, 90% of all software engineering is estimated to be um, software maintenance. So that's a pretty huge field that we are all try trying to tackle with GI. So our goal here is to find patterns in GI experiments, validate that they are doing what we think they are doing, for example, improve runtime, and then use these patterns in later GI runs. So as an introduction, uh, the Amaro framework is basically split into two parts, the genetic improvement part you can see here on the left and the pattern mining part seen on the right. Genetic improvement basically provides the data that we use with pattern mining and then we use the identified patterns to improve them again with uh, to improve the genetic improvement process. As a base we have the Graal compiler and the Truffle interpreter. The Graal compiler is part of the open JDK so it's available in Java basically. And what that gives us is pretty low level access to language, allowing us, for example, to access the stack and the heap and use this information in genetic improvement. So if you've read the paper, you have seen this graphic, which is basically a high level overview of the architecture of the framework. And I'm just going to summarize it here for you, what the advantages of this are and the disadvantages. So first of all, we run directly in the compiler and we have access to the stack and the heap we have a much finer granularity than you would be used to from other frameworks because we do not operate on source code, we operate on the representation Truffle uses, the abstract syntax tree, and we could in theory also extend this to go to the uh, control for graphs that Graal is using. We also get information on the language provided by Graal and Truffle, so for example we know what statement is a looping statement or which one is a branching statement and can use that information in our genetic improvement operators. As a disadvantage, this means that the granularity is much higher than what you would be used to, which increases the search space size. And you need to work on your genetic improvement operators to capture the information on the compiler and actually use it. So we also use algorithms that learn. So basically we mine information on the language and we then apply that information in the, our genetic improvement runs. And we're going to see later how that works. And we can also apply patterns that we're going to later identify from our runs. And one of the major disadvantages of the knowledge gauge genetic improvement algorithm that I'm going to show you later is the performance of the GI operators. Because it has to apply that knowledge and look through the search space, it works slower than a random mutation, for example. So at the optimizer side, uh, sorry, at the knowledge base side here, we actually use a new VRJ database to store all of the experiment data for analysis later. So we identify the individuals in the population, store them away, and we also identify which crossover or which mutation operator was responsible and what input did it take, so we can also trace the genealogy later. Uh, another advantage is that we have instantly reproducible experiments because all of the settings and all of the run data is basically stored in the database. And you can publish that by just publishing a new 4 j database export. At the optimizer side, um, we have extensible algorithms, so we've made sure to make this framework be able to connect to other frameworks. The only current connector is to Heuristic Lab, which is a meta uh, suit that is pretty popular at Gecko, I think. And we also allow for parallel distributed execution, so you have basically workers that can run on any PC, connect to a command plane, and that command plane runs your experiments from any PC that you want to actually work on. And here at the bottom, at the final parts, we have the pattern mining, which is just here to identify patterns and to validate these patterns and then provide them to the KGGI algorithm. 
So as an overview of the advantages, let's take a deep dive into what the two major algorithms in the framework actually do. So we're going to start at the genetic improvement side with knowledge-guided genetic improvement. Knowledge-guided genetic improvement is basically a combination of grammar-guided genetic programming and pre-genetic programming. Basically, this just means that we use abstract syntax trees and that we, because we use the draft information, can only produce abstract syntax trees that are actually correct in the language and they will always compile. They might not run because there might be runtime exceptions, but they will always compile. So we enrich all of that information with metadata. So for example, a for and a while statement are both loops and an if statement is a branch, but also for example, an or and an and is a branch. And we can capture non-functional properties, basically via brute force mining different language concepts and measuring the impact on memory, runtime performance and so on. So our operators can also access the context that, the soft, uh, that our part of the code that we want to optimize is running in. So we have access to the stack and the heap and to the functions that are available currently by the linker. And we apply all of that in a concept known as the syntax graph. So how does that work? On the left, you see an abstract syntax tree where we've chosen, chosen a random mutation point, in our case, the condition of the for loop. And on the right, you see the syntax graph which is basically a graph structure that is recursive. So the entry strategy decides what do we want to mutate here, what would be valid in that context. The root strategy then is just a delegate to all other strategies in the language. In our case, we just draw a subset of less than, greater than, um, read integer variable, and an if statement. And those can obviously go back to the root strategy if they have child nodes. So let's start at the mutation point. In our case, only a Boolean variable is valid in that context. So the entry st strategy gets constraints. We say, for example, we have a maximum depth of three that we want to generate at that point. We allow only one branch and we want the approximated runtime performance to be limited to 100 nanoseconds. The entry strategy takes this query and basically asks the strategy who can provide me a, a syntax tree that fulfills all of this criteria. And in our case, because we want the Boolean operation, we only get those two strategies activated. And let's say we randomly select one of those, for example, less than, and inject it here. So now we can look at an example of applying a pattern in knowledge graduated improvement. Let's say we have this pattern you've seen here. So if we have a four, where I write a step variable, I want to obviously use the step variable in our condition. So we then enforce that because this pattern here matches, this mutation point must read of an integer. And of course, only that one is gonna activate because we just have to read int here. And we're gonna only activate for one of two different uh, variables that would be len or i, the only two available in the context. And because the pattern says we need to use the one in the for loop, we're gonna mutate the in. So at the next mutation point, we can look at the context again, and we could activate the less or greater, but maybe the depth is too high already. And because of this, we say, okay, the read end can activate because we can still read the length variable. And in that case, we then mutate that in. And that's basically how knowledge graduating improvement works. So the syntax graph is available both for the mutator, which you've seen here as an example, but also for the crossover, in that case, it basically just goes through the tree and collects all of these constraints, maybe applied by different patterns and applied by different strategies, for example, for reading or writing. Let's say we mutate here later and I read the length variable, then we add a constraint, the length variable must be initialized. And that can be taken in the crossover points, compared, and then we only cross points that actually make sense because they, again, fulfill all of the requirements. So that's basically the genetic improvement side of the Mara framework. And on the other side, what do we do then with the data when we've run a few experiments? Well, then we go to pattern mining. And for that, the core algorithm is the independent growth of ordered relationships or IGOR algorithm. So the IGOR algorithm um, is a discriminative pattern mining approach. And to get there, we have to define a few words. So mining of frequently recurring substructures basically just means I want to mine structures that occur more than once uh, that 
could be more than once in one abstract syntax tree, or that could be over multiple syntax trees. In our case, we all always want to mine over multiple trees. Um, significant is then just an extension saying it occurs with a minimum support. So basically, frequently in at least 50% of all the trees. Discriminative pattern mining then is basically saying I group all of my individuals into at least two groups. In software fault mining, we usually go succeeding abstract syntax trees and failing ones, so according to unit test, for example. And the discriminative pattern occurs more in the succeeding ones and less in the failing ones or the other way around. So as an example of how we mine performance patterns, we usually split those into three different groups, the fast abstract syntax trees, the slow ones, and the ones that lead to a timeout. So that are basically so slow that we either cannot measure the runtime performance within a limit or that might actually just never finish because there's an endless loop or so thing in there. And then we provide the metrics to the Igo algorithm, say for example 50% significant, so must occur at least half of all the abstract syntax trees in our group, and 75% discriminative, basically meaning if it occurs in all of those, it can still occur in at least or in up to 25% of the slow ones, but if it's 26%, this is not the valid pattern anymore. And down here you can basically see one of the generated reports of the Amaro framework that would say, okay, hey, this pattern only occurs in the fast algorithms, this pattern occurs in all of them, but mostly in the fast ones, or this one does not occur at all in the timeout, that's why it's discriminative again. So you kind of see how we mine patterns. So let's take an example of what the Amaro framework does with patterns and the few core concepts of that. Here we have a bug pattern of an uninitialized variable, which is pretty simple to explain. You have a read somewhere, let's say read to a length variable of integer, and you did never initialize that variable. In the case of C, C does not auto initialize variables if they are declared. That would mean we have a fault of omission the variable was never assigned, and that's why that will return a runtime exception. So we actually use taxonomies while mining, because the real read would be probably read stack integer variable, or read stack string variable, or read heap variable, and so on. And we can actually mine at the really low level, or we can go higher, because it doesn't really matter if it's the stack or the heap, or if it's a specific variable type, this will always lead to that exception, so we can generalize our patterns. So these taxonomies, we can actually auto-generate again from the language context and basically build a hierarchy of the entire language structure that Truffle is providing us. But you can also do that manually. So for example, if you want to mine for a specific um, topic, let's say data flow or control flow, you can actually combine your own taxonomies and then use those for mining and generalize again. So you could also combine the for loop and the while loop into a large loop statement, or you could, for example, just take the if statement and a few other statements together with the for loop and just say all of those are controlled for structures. So we also supply wildcards. This wildcard is embedded, and embedded in the context of patterns usually means that it doesn't really matter if there's nodes in between there, but the right has to occur to the left or before the read statement in this case. So we also only consider ordered patterns. Um, most other mining algorithms compared to Igor, for example, the sleuth algorithm, which is really good for mining trees, considers unordered patterns. And in the context of software, the statement order of source code is kind of important. So Igor only goes for ordered, but we go for embedded or for induced. An induced pattern would be that this has to be an explicit node. For example, let's say, a block statement, and there cannot be any other nodes in between the block statement and the write and the read. So the other wildcard we're supporting is the missing wildcard. So basically, we are saying, hey, the absence of this write node is the problem. This pattern is available for developers to enhance their own patterns. Um, the framework itself does not support automatically finding missing nodes, because pretty much everything that's not there is missing. So that's kind of an overload. The, how you actually find this pattern is that you find that in the successful nodes you find a right read and in the unsuccessful ones you only find the read and you as a developer make the connection. 
So audit patterns already talked about that. It is important that the missing read is before the read. We do not care about missing reads after the read. And we also consider variables. So the zero underline here basically just means this is the first variable in that pattern that we are considering. A pattern could consider more variables and it will always make sure that these variables are taken in the same context in the pattern. So how do we then validate patterns when we have found them? Well, we use the KHGI syntax graph actually again, but we only use mutations of n abstract syntax trees. The n is up to you. You can do 100 verifications, you can do 10,000 verifications. Basically, the more trees you have, the more sure you can be of your pattern. And then you validate your confidence against the hypothesis. So for example, let's say I want to have at least 90% of the abstract syntax trees that I apply this pattern to, to have a speed up or to fail due to this specific exception, making it basically provable that this pattern produces that bug. The unfortunate thing is that side effects prevent 100% confidence always. Simple example, we have the pattern validation of our missing right read. And in the case of the truffle interpreter, that will lead to an illegal state exception. So basically illegal state, this was not initialized. Um, we can identify the cause with 82.7% confidence only. Why is that? When we try to apply this pattern to random abstract syntax trees, then we have the problem that you can see here, there's a few different exceptions that fall, for example, a null pointer exception or an index out of bounds exception, because we broke something else in the code by applying this pattern. And the other thing is, source code has branches, and not all of those branches always are executed. And that is basically why we still get a few successful ones in, even though we remove the right to the read statement that just is never executed. So 82.7% confidence is actually pretty good. That is enough confidence for us to be sure that that is the cause of this bug. And the fix, so for example, we enforce that there is a write before a read. We have done here 94.27% confidence and you see here, okay, for only 74 are successful. Why is our confidence higher? Well, if we have a fix, we only want to fix that one bug. And that one bug is fixed. The illegal state exception is only occurring 5.73% of the time. 74% is success is pretty good. But in some cases, we have created a write that breaks something else. And we probably need more patterns to fix those bugs again. So, what are our initial results of using patterns in genetic improvement? Um, we have actually done 25 experiments of different algorithms, and I'm presenting one here. Uh, this one is of, uh, I think, the shaker sort algorithm that we tried to optimize. And on the top, you can see basically the amount of failing, successful, or those that are just leading to a few tests not producing the correct result, but still not producing a runtime exception. That's the blue ones. And you can see at the top, knowledge gap check the improvement without patterns. And at the bottom, you can see it running with patterns, um, specifically 13 patterns that prevent bugs. So you see in the first generation, most of the trees actually fail if you do not apply patterns. And while it gets better over time, basically because the diversity is so low that we just have a lot of bloat where the bloat gets optimized in. Uh, because of this, we have a slight increase in successful abstract syntax trees, the green ones, but it doesn't really get that much better. If you compare that when applying patterns, already in the first generation, we have about 20 more successful trees, and we have instead of almost 100 failing, we only have about 35 failing. And that gets much, much better with further generations. So that's already pretty good for getting more diversity in a population. And that's also pretty good for actually finding abstract syntax trees that you can make patterns from that are successful. Um, so we then also try to improve the runtime performance. In this case, I'm showing the results of the neural network algorithms or specifically one neural network that we had different activation functions in. And at the baseline, again, knowledge genetic improvement, the best 
successful, uh, sorry, that the baseline, the original source code written by a developer as taken from reference literature is in blue. And the best uh, syntax tree produced by a pattern is shown in orange or to the right. So you can see that all of them have an improvement. This one is a pretty brutal one, but this one is an outlier because it actually um, basically cheated on the test, it just returns the, the input to the output again with the validation set. But the other ones are actual correct results and improve the runtime performance because we have applied the patterns. So overall, we have doubled amount, the amount of abstract syntax trees. We have doubled the amount of successful trees just because the entire population size is doubled. And we are down from 60% of syntax trees that are failing during our runtime to only 32.7%. Reference literature actually says that 80% fail at runtime, so KGGI without patterns is already pretty good, but with patterns it's even better. In runtime performance out of 25 experiments, we have successfully improved 22, on average about 33% faster. So if they ran 100 seconds before, they now run about 70 seconds. So some benefits of the our framework are that you can use GI at the compiler level, you can identify and explain patterns from your experiments, you can then apply these patterns in genetic improvement, and you overall improve the population quality and diversity in the GA runs. The drawbacks are on the large search bases. The runtime performance uh, measurement is pretty costly because in the compiler you actually have to measure everything 200,000 times instead of 10 to 20 times as is usual in the GI community. And the mutation and crossover operations are actually pretty costly because of the syntax graph re recursive evaluation. As an outlook, I'm gonna improve Amaro for ease of use, add additional algorithms, and uh, want to automate the pattern mining a little bit more. I want to add additional connectors, so two more truffle languages at first, and in the future maybe two additional compilers. And that's it. And I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention or for watching that video. If you are with me, if you're not live here at Gecko, or if you're watching this later. And if you have any questions, this was actually my PhD work and I'm still working on it. It's pretty fun. So I'm happy to collaborate or to just work with you if you use my framework.